Hello, my name is Matt and this is a video response to a question that was posted on Reddit some days ago. The, plot, the problem that led to, to the question is as follows. Somebody has a garage door and a sensor that detects when a car is standing in front of the garage door. This sensor emits a pulse when it detects a car and as a consequence of this pulse the garage door starts opening. But, but this sensor sometimes detects the car twice and this leads to two pulses being emitted approximately three seconds apart from each other. And the garage door starts opening on the first pulse but then stops opening when it receives the second pulse. So the poster wanted to somehow cancel out the second pulse here and just trigger on the first pulse. He wanted to do that without microcontroller. And one suggestion that came up was to, to stretch the pulse. This means that this pulse here is being translated into a pulse that is much longer. And assuming that the garage door is triggering on a rising edge, basically doesn't matter how long the pulse remains high. And in the case of two pulses following each other, this pulse would then just being stretched even further so that if you want to stretch the pulse to let's say five seconds from the second pulse um, to the end of, of the output pulse would then be five seconds so the, the pulse would be stretched even more. The guy who suggested this, this solution also suggested to use a triple five timer chip to, to implement this. And I believe that, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's just that I really like minimalistic circuits and I think there is a way to do this without triple five timer. In addition to that, because the triple five in its monostable configuration is, is triggering <clears throat> on a falling edge, you'd have to invert that, that whole signal to get a falling edge when the pulse is arriving. So you, you need a transistor or, or some sort of inverter to invert that and that would add additional complexity to the circuit. So I think I came up with an alternative solution and I'd like to share that. I'm using a circuit called Peak Detector and I drew the schematic here so, so let's just discuss this schematic a little bit. Let's first assume that this capacitor here is initially discharged. So, when the first pulse arrives, there is current flowing through this diode here into the capacitor and also into this resistor. And as a consequence of that, the, the capacitor is being charged. And because there isn't any, any resistance inside this path, this capacitor is charged quite fast. So when this pulse is over here, there is no more current flowing through the diode and this capacitor starts to discharge but it cannot discharge through the diode because when the pulse is over this diode is reverse biased so the only way for this capacitor to discharge really is to, to discharge through this resistor and this means that we have to look at how, how a capacitor is discharging as a function of time and its initial voltage and its capacity and the resistor through which it's discharging which leads me to the curves down here there is a time on this axis and voltage on, on that axis and you can see how the capacitor is discharging over time from its initial voltage v naught. if you select low values for capacitance and, and resistor in this circuit here then the capacitor is going to charge quite fast. However, if you pick large values for either the capacitor, the resistor, or even both, then it's discharging much slower. And the formula that tells you how fast this capacitor is discharging as a function of time, the resistance and the capacitance is this formula over here. You can see that um, Essentially what matters is the product of the resistance and the capacitance. So if you have 
large values for RNC, then you end up with this curve here. And for slower values, the capacity is just discharging a little bit faster. So this means that you could actually pick some threshold voltage that you want to reach after, let's say, five seconds. You know that you're charging your capacitor initially to, let's say, five volts. So you can solve this equation here for R times C and you end up with values for R and C. I'll come back to that a bit later, but let's first look at the circuit that I built up. To so I built up this circuit here on the breadboard and the yellow lead here is uh, the signal that is coming from the sensor, but obviously I don't have this sensor, so I'm just using a microcontroller to simulate the two pulses. I'm tapping off this signal, so this lead here just goes into one probe of my oscilloscope, and the signal flows through this diode here, and the cathode of this diode is connected to a capacitor and a resistor in parallel that go down to ground. I'm also measuring with the second channel of my oscilloscope this node that is the cathode of the of the diode and um, the the resistor and the capacitor. So let's have a look at the oscilloscope. The yellow trace that you can see here is just the signal coming from the sensor. So that's two pulses, 100 milliseconds uh, each and they're three seconds apart from each other. That is uh, one, two, three, and the time, uh, time base is set to one second per division, so that's basically three seconds here. And then it takes another 10 seconds for the pattern to repeat, so I'm always repeating this two-pulse pattern, and I want to look at this node uh, of the cathode of the diode and see how the capacitor uh, is discharging. And I can see this if I turn on the blue channel here. It will, however, take some time uh, to, to re-trigger because this only happens every 10 seconds. And it just happened and you can see how the capacitor is being charged. This is on the blue trace, this is two volts per division. So it's being charged up to slightly more than four volts, which makes sense because my signal from the sensor peaks at 5 volts and if you subtract the diode drop from these 5 volts you end up with 4 point something volts which is which is exactly what you get. So <clears throat> after the pulse is over this capacitor is discharging very slowly and upon the second pulse the capacitor is being charged again almost almost instantly and starts to discharge all over again and this takes 10 seconds and after 10 seconds we, we arrive here, which is, which is 2 volts, because this is 2 volts per division here, and, and uh, ground is here. So after 10 seconds we reach 2 volts, and because the pattern is being repeated after 10 seconds, the capacity is just being charged again. So if we set the threshold to, let's say, 3 volts, this would stretch the pulse to approximately five seconds and we would get exactly what we want. We, we would be able to absorb this second pulse um, as part of a stretched long pulse. Coming back to our circuit, we have established that in order to have the capacitor discharged to let's say two volts after five seconds, we need a specific value for R multiplied by C. However, we could pick, let's say, 100 microfarads for the capacitor and 1K for the resistor, or 1 microfarad for the capacitor and 100K for the resistor, and R times C would, in both cases, be the same. So, how do we really select the capacitor and the resistance? Does it matter? And if we just look at how the capacitor is discharging, it doesn't really matter. But there is one more thing that is important and that people tend to, to forget about all of that. Is let's assume that we, we selected a, a pretty slow resistance and to compensate for that quite a large capacitor. Then when the pulse goes high, 
there is going to be a lot of current flowing through the resistor down to ground and also because the capacitor is so large it will absorb a lot of charge to reach a specific voltage so that particular selection is not really good because this is this is pulling a lot of power in fact the sensor might not even be be able to source all of that current so as a rule of thumb it, it would be smarter to select a reasonably small capacitor and a reasonably large resistor now as a last step let's discuss let's discuss this buffer here assuming that this is a digital buffer. So all this buffer does is basically if the input is below some threshold then the output is pulled down to ground and if the input is above the threshold then the output is pulled to whatever supply voltage you have. So maybe it's not even necessary to, to put this buffer chip for this particular application because assuming that the garage door is is able to cope with the fact that the edge, the falling edge that is generated by the capacitor that is discharging is pretty slow. If that doesn't confuse um, the circuit that is part of the garage door, then we should be fine because the rising edge that is relevant for triggering the garage door action is, is uh, it's quite fast. And if the garage door itself doesn't have a, a low input impedance that is because there is going to be some impedance in there down to ground right and if this impedance is, is sufficiently large that it wouldn't affect the resistor value here and therefore the discharging of the capacitor then we probably might even be able to get away without, uh, without actually um, designing in, in that buffer so that's it. I hope you found that mildly interesting and if you want to share some thoughts on that, please do it in the comments.